Welcome to this week's episode of The Read Out Loud, a weekly biotech podcast from STAT. I'm Allison DeAngelis. And I'm Damian Garde. Adam Forestine is out this week. It's Thursday, October 5th, and here's what we're going to talk about. The Nobel Prize in Medicine went to two pioneers from the world of messenger RNA. STAT's Megan Molteni joins us to talk about what their win means and whether the oft-criticized institution is showing signs of evolution. And why don't we have a vaccine for HIV? Our colleague Jason Mass joins us to explain how a holy grail of public health remains out of reach despite a revolution in vaccine research. All that after a word from our sponsor. From breakthroughs in drug developments to inside scoops on billion dollar deals. Join us October 18th and 19th for the annual STAT Summit. This year's speaker lineup is one you won't want to miss and includes Michael J. Fox, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, Nubar Afayan, Emma Walmsley, and Daniel Skrvonsky. They'll discuss their groundbreaking work in the lab and the boardroom and its impact on the future of health and medicine. Virtual and in-person tickets in Boston are selling fast, so don't miss this incredible lineup. Secure your Stat Summit ticket today at statnews.com slash events. Well, it's Nobel week here at STAT. So let's talk about the prize in medicine, which was awarded to uh, Catalin uh, Ketiko and Drew Weissman for their work bringing messenger RNA or mRNA on this 40 year journey from an obscure corner of cell biology to a pandemic halting vaccine technology. So our colleague Megan Molteni leads STAT's Nobel coverage each year and wrote, of course, about the significance of Kadiko and Weissman's selection this week. And she joins us now to discuss the new laureates. Megan, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be here. So, Megan, you wrote that it was kind of a rarity for this partnership to be recognized by the Nobel committee. Why is that notable. I mean, we see partnerships, you know, we see different teams of people get Nobel Prizes all the time. Yeah, I think what seemed notable to me is if you look at the Nobel and and honestly, a lot of these other big prizes, you often don't see the people who are actually doing the experiments, you know, hands on, like getting these awards. That work is often being done by postdocs and, you know, younger researchers in the labs who, you know, aren't the ones who are, you know, going out and and getting grants and, you know, sort of running research programs. And, you know, so so to me, what sort of stood out was in recognizing Carico in this situation. You know, she's the one who's really doing all of those experiments. And obviously she's not a postdoc. The reason she's doing those experiments is because, you know, as, as has been written about her career, Damien, you know, I think you were one of the earliest people to do it. She had you know, she wasn't good at playing that game of science of getting that external funding. And so she wound up, you know, sort of working in in other people's labs and relying on, you know, sort of partners at the University of Pennsylvania to move her research forward. And what I think is notable is that in Weissman, she really found, you know, like a thought, like a thought partner, you know, someone who understood her vision, saw an application for it, and the two of them worked together fruitfully for, I mean, like more than 20 years. And and more often with the Nobels, you see people who are, you know, they might collaborate from time to time, but they're both running their own labs. They're often in different institutions. And so, you know, they might be right, you know, out and out competitors, both driving toward the same goal. And so to me, this just, you know, stood out as sort of a notable departure um, from that, that sort of you know, underlined, I guess to me, like what I see in Weissman is sort of an example of someone who, recognizing someone for whom the scientific system, the scientific enterprise really works, like he sort of worked (laughs) that system and did everything right. Um, And those are the type of people you often see honored with these prizes. And Carrico is sort of on the other side of that, you know, obviously the science was there, the, you know, brilliance was there. Um, but being able to play that game, just, you know, that wasn't her strong suit. And so I just thought it was, I thought it was notable to see them, you know, paired together. They're obviously, I think, the people who've done the most to, to push this really, you know, as you wrote, Damien, like real backwater field, you know, into the forefront so that it was well positioned 
um, to be able to be, you know, turned to when we had the COVID pandemic emerge in 2020. So Kariko's biography in particular has been a topic of conversation this week because her unwavering dedication to mRNA and the University of Pennsylvania's unwillingness to support it nearly ended her career three decades ago. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we, we and others have written about just this brush with basically ending a career in science that now has led to a Nobel Prize, basically because, as you said, she struggled to, to play the game and was thwarted uh, at many instances in her efforts to advance what she believed, and obviously ended up being vindicated, was the promise of this technology and um, this like kind of like buddy comedy that her and Weissman have, in which you know they ended up finding or forging a scientific relationship in which they could accentuate one another's um, good qualities and get to this point. So I guess my question is, you know, how does this prize fit into that biography as just like a portrait of how science is done? And then I wondered, you know, because you covered this and, and saw the press conferences and talked to people, how is the University of Pennsylvania handling the awkward situation of celebrating a scientist that that same institution once demoted? I mean, I'll take the latter question first, which is just, I think they're just not <laughs> acknowledging it. They're just sort of ignoring that that um, whole, you know, chapter sort of ever, ever was, you know, in the in the press conference itself, um, you know, questions were not asked live. They were taken ahead of time. And uh, I, sus I, I myself wrote a question along this line, which was not uh, taken. I suspect others were as well, since this is a well-known, um, you know, part of her history. And in favor of questions that were um, actually coming from in-house <laughs> University of Pennsylvania publications, so so they they didn't didn't go there. Um, I would say is the way that they have been handling it because I think it does definitely represent a pretty awkward um, situation for them. And you know, mm. um, Carico has been she's been more um, forthcoming about that. You know, she's given interviews um, where she's she's been pretty open about you know how hard that how hard that was. It sounds like, um, you know, if uh, interview she gave recently that, that after she won the Lasker award, which was in 2021, um, Penn actually you know, like gave her, you know, promoted her to like a, a bigger position. She just had, she'd kept sort of a teaching position, but it was a very low level position. So who knows what, um, might be coming now that the Nobel is in, is in her, um, back pocket. So I, I think the lesson here for universities, you know, is that, that you can't, I, th I think, I think you can't just judge scientists on the kind of, you know, the amount of money that they're, that they're bringing in. And I do think it sort of speaks to some deficiencies in the way that system is set up. Um, because, you know, as, as she has pointed out, and I think others point out, there, you know, there are probably so many people like her who have an idea, are really good scientists, and but that idea is just not popular. You know, science has fads; they go in and out. You can't always explain them. And you know, if every scientist who has a great idea is you know following a fad because that's where the money is, you know, I think that the the sort of net effect on science and the net effect on breakthroughs is that we'll actually, you know, be seeing, you know, fewer, fewer of them. And, and, and I actually think that there's a little bit of data to support this. There was um, an analysis out earlier this year about sort of the time between um, a Nobel laureate, you know, making their discovery and actually receiving the prize. And in the last um, 60 years, that time has actually doubled. Um, and so now most people are waiting more than 20 years between discovery and awarding of the prize. And, you know, the researchers who conducted that analysis, um, you know, point to this um, phenomenon that it, it, it's a signal that there's a, been a decrease in disruptive science. Well, it's, it's fascinating now to kind of look at the, you know, this most recent Nobel Award for for mRNA vaccines, which, you know, that technology has been in development for for many years, but only kind of entered the general you know consciousness in the last three with with the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, famously, like kind of predicting who is going to win a Nobel is a bit of a fool's errand. But were Kerry Co and Weissman 
on short lists? Like, was it a surprise that they got the prize now when the application of their discovery was so recent? No, I don't. I think for people who have been watching this space, one of the primary things that Nobel prognosticators look to is um, other sort of precedent setting awards. So you've got the Gardner, the Lasker, the Wolf, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. And once you sort of win five of those, it becomes pretty hard for the Nobel uh, assembly to ignore your, your work. And it just becomes sort of a question of, of when. And, um, Weissman and Carrico both had five of those. And so it was sort of expected that it would be happening sometime. Although I think there's also sort of this concept of, of, of periodicity. So the, in, the, in the medicine award, they tend to go back and forth between something super basic um, and something more applied that has a clinical um, you know, impact on, on human health. And last year was sort of a weird one with those paleo genomics. It sort of didn't fit into either of those. So it sort of seemed like maybe a clinical application was, was going to be on the assembly's mind. So I, I think this had been floating around. I will say that, um, you know, in the press conference, Weissman talked about what he, you know, the phone call that he eventually had with, um, Thomas Perlman, who's, who's, you know, from the Nobel Committee, and he had said that the committee was um, trying in their efforts to be more recent, to sort of recognize um, discoveries that were, you know, sort of more, you know, in people's minds, more like au courant. And I mean, I haven't fact checked that with the with the Nobel Assembly, so that's kind of on on Weissman's word. But I think that would constitute a bit of a departure for them. Well, on that topic. Each Nobel season kind of brings a fresh opportunity to discuss the ways in which when you zoom out, this whole endeavor is is a little silly. Like there's a longstanding criticism that honoring just a handful of individuals for any major breakthrough distorts the actuality, the team oriented nature of how science is in fact done in real life. And that it's a process that historically demonstrably has overlooked important contributions of women and people of color in particular. So with all that said, I mean, and, and in part informed by, by the comments that Weissman had, are there signs that the Nobels are evolving, perhaps, in the face of those criticisms, or that any of that commentary has resonated with the people in Scandinavia who actually make these decisions? I think not in an overt way. You know, certainly there haven't been signs that there are going to be changes, you know, big changes to the way the assembly makes these decisions, right? And the way they do is there's sort of a small committee that vets nominations and puts a, um, you know, a slate of of candidates in front of the assembly. And then this 50 person body votes on the first Monday in October, you know, the, all, all of that is not changing. Are, you know, are the kinds of people who are being nominated substantially different than what we've seen in past years. We can't know that because those are confidential um, for many, many years. So I think it'll be a long time before we know. So I, I don't think there is um, at this point signs that things are changing. You know, if you think Cuddling Carico is 13, the 13th woman, you know, and there's more than 200, 200 men. So there's still... Um, you know, a long, a long way to go. And I, and especially on the point of, you know, the fact that science is very much a team sport, it's only getting more that way. You know, there's like the, especially in biology, you have people who have wet lab experience, you have people with bio, you know, computational work, there's people, you know, who are working on these algorithms and just, and more and more, these are just, you know, you're seeing these the biggest papers that, you know, are sort of creating the biggest splashes, you know, they might have 50, you know, authors on it. You know, that's really where we are today. And so, you know, I, I still think that, um, that the way the Nobels do things in terms of who they recognize is quite archaic, um, you know, given the way science works um, at this moment. Well, that is a rather complex situation. I'm going to boil it down uh really, really uh, low. Um, now that mRNA is off the table, like, who do you think, what discoveries are on the shortlist for 2024? You know, it's never too early to start making predictions. 
<laughs> well, I, I got put on this this prediction um, assignment last year, and I got one right in my first try. So I, I told the higher ups I'm not doing it again because, like, you can only go down from there. Um, <laughs> but it, for people who who look at this, you know, again to go back to sort of the people who. Um, scientists who have won a lot of these precedent setting awards. There's been a lot of talk um, about Arthur Horwich, who's at Yale, and Franz Ulrich Hartel at Max Planck, and their um, some seminal discoveries on protein folding and how proteins are act- actually sort of you know processed and exist in cells. That's like very foundational work. Um, There's also in the world of microRNAs. So whereas messenger RNA is the, is the, you know, recipe that tells the cell how to make a protein microRNAs, um, you know, actually sort of work in terms of gene expression. Um, They'll, you know, might bind to the DNA itself or recruit other, you know, enzymes to, you know, flip genes on and off. Um, And the people who have done the most work there are Victor Ambrose and Gary Rovkin. They've won a number of prizes. So they're also in the mix. And then I think, you know, if in fact the Nobel Assembly sticks with this sort of uh, going with more of a like, what's in the in the air? What's the zeitgeist? I think we have to talk about GLP one uh, receptor agonists, which obviously we've been writing about a lot at Stat, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just a little bit, just a little bit, yeah. And uh, you know, there it's tricky. There's a lot of people involved, but if you think about the people who've had the biggest impacts on the field, um, you know, over many decades, just like, you know, thousand, I think they're up to like between the two of them, more than 2000 papers on GLP one biology, that would be Dan Drucker, um, in Toronto and Jens Juel Holst at the university of, um, Copenhagen in Denmark. So I think those are the names that are out there, but, um, I'm certainly not going to be making a prediction myself anytime soon. Well, we will not hold you to any of that, but Megan, thank you for joining us to explain. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. We're living through what feels like a golden age in vaccine research. Scientists invented powerful vaccines for COVID-19 within a year of SARS-CoV-2's emergence, and the long-held goal of vaccinating against RSV finally came to fruition this year. But despite four decades of work and billions of dollars of investment, researchers have never managed to craft an effective vaccine against HIV, a virus that has killed more than 40 million people worldwide. Stats' Jason Mass wrote a story this week looking at the dogged quest to finally invent such a vaccine and the complicated roadblocks that lay ahead of it. He joins us now to talk about it. Jason, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to be here. So, Jason, as we mentioned before, new technologies have led to pioneering vaccines for several serious public health concerns. What about HIV makes it so resistant to, you know, some of science's best ideas and uh, tools? Yeah, I mean, so there's a there's a great quote from early in the pandemic uh, by I think like Michael Farz on its scripts, where he's like, COVID, it's a, it, I think he called it a stupid, easy virus to vaccinate against. <laughs> there's a giant spike protein. It's just hanging out, basically unprotected on the top of the virus. And you just block that and you're good, basically. Um, HIV is sort of the complete opposite of that. It is probably the craftiest, wiliest virus um, humanity has ever encountered, um, or at least ever tried to vaccinate against. Um, It is, there is no obvious spike protein. There are multiple proteins one could imagine blocking, but it is, but they are covered by basically a forest of of sugars that that protect it and and make it hard for the immune system to see it and recognize it. Um, It shapeshifts so easily. Um, And so if you were to build a powerful um, antibodies or what have you against a particular spot on the virus, um, it's very easy for that for the virus to just mutate in a way that makes that um, effort uh, completely ineffective. Um, It you have to, um, for COVID, as we all learned, you want to get protection against severe disease. If you get um, guard against uh, infection, that's great, but you don't need that. Um, HIV, 
it's a permanent virus. It will snake into your genome. It will stay there forever. And so you need to block it off from the start. You can't have asymptomatic infection. You need, the bar is just so, so much higher. Um, it feeds on immune cells. And so certain vaccines, you can actually imagine um, if it sends a bunch of T cells to um, the virus to like snuff it out, most viruses would be terrified and die. HIV is like feeding frenzy, amazing. I'm just going to infect all these T cells. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's, it's just incredibly, incredibly difficult. It's got all these different tactics. Um, and so it's taken sort of the best, um, ideas and, and, and wildest ideas in, in, in science to get any traction, uh, whatsoever. Well, speaking of best and wildest ideas, your story begins with Lewis Picker, a scientist at Oregon Health Sciences, who's working on a novel approach to preventing HIV infection with a vaccine. How would that vaccine work? Lewis is sort of, um, he's, a, he's a leading figure. Um, his idea is, um, has a lot of backers, has a lot of excitement around it, or at least has had some for, for a few years. But he's actually, he's sort of a little bit outside the normal box of, of what the mainstream approaches are. And the, and the mainstream approach is to um, basically, uh, it's this really cool idea called germline targeting. And you give basically a successive series of shots that hopefully will nudge the immune system to make these sort of perfect antibodies um, against the virus that, that will just be sort of the exact repertoire of weapons that you need. Uh, Moderna's working on this, IAVI, NIH, a bunch of academics. Um, Lewis is probably maybe the leading dark horse approach. Um, and basically, he his idea um, that he sort of stumbled on in the 90s, early 2000s-ish was hey, there is this other virus um, that infects humans. It's called CMV. It's generally benign, um, uh, but it stays in you forever um, because it's really good at sort of uh, manipulating the immune system. Um, and it stokes these really powerful T-cell responses. Um, and so he was like, hey, if we put HIV proteins in a uh, sort of weakened or, or, or modified CMV virus, we can maybe stoke those same level of, of T cells, uh, that same sort of potent T cell response against the virus. Um, and it's taken, as it often does, a long time to sort of bring that forward. But um, maybe a few years, 10-ish uh, years ago, he showed some really powerful responses in monkeys, sort of like a 59% protection rate, which is really high um, for this kind of thing. Um, and it seems that it works by stoking a very particular type of immune response that sort of no other vaccine does. Um, and, it's, and it's weird. It's, it's, it's sort of, it makes these kind of like crappy T cells sort of that don't attack too much, but attack sort of just the right amount and in just the right way to maybe snuff out the virus. Um, and so it's been in development for a long time. They tested a, one version a couple of years ago that wasn't sort of, it was sort of a prototype didn't work out so well. Um, they've got a new version. It's got some more modifications to the virus, some other stuff. Um, and hopefully this will have uh, better results in, in this uh, new, new, new trial. And then you, as you point out in, in your article, as the search for the vaccines has been going on over these last couple of decades, the scientific community has actually made a lot of progress in treating people who contract the virus. Um, that's created a kind of paradoxical problem for vaccine developers, you know, in the year 2023. What's I mean, what's the problem with having treatments for people? This is sort of one of the greatest probably success stories in public health in the last 30 years, or at least success stories in, sort of, in terms of pharma and public health. Um, and basically, scientists figured out um, o over a decade ago that if you give people who are at risk for HIV but don't actually have the virus pills for HIV, it will basically almost entirely protect them from ever getting um, infected with pretty minimal side effects. Um, and so that's called PrEP. It's been used around the world um, uh, and, it, and it's really effective. Um, and it's really amazing. Um, but people don't always take it. Um, it's hard to take a daily pill every day for lots of reasons. There are access issues across the board, um, lots of problems with it. But there are now these new um, antivirals that are sort of coming online that uh, basically you give an injection and you don't have to take a daily pill. You just get an injection. Right now it's every two months, but there's every six month um, shot sort of on the horizon. And there's even some early data, um, I believe, on every 
um, every 12 months, so a once a year shot. Um, and what that means for HIV vaccine development is how exactly are you supposed to test a shot um, and prove that it's effective in a world where these alternatives exist? Um, so for example, if you were going to set up a trial, you can't randomize a patient to get placebo if you know that um, there is this 90, 95, 99% effective alternative freely available. Um, and in the past, people have sort of been able to get around this with the with the older pill prep because people don't always take prep, so you can offer it to them, um, and they might say no, or they might say yes, but not actually take it. You can still sort of tease out the effect of the vaccine. But if we're in a world where there's an annual shot that is um, highly, highly effective against HIV, it's just going to be immensely difficult to run a clinical trial and prove that a um, that this new vaccine works. Well, and, and to quickly follow up, you mentioned, you know, PrEP, depending on like, you know, the adherence is, you know, 90, 99 percent effective. Uh, what kind of effectiveness are we seeing for, you know, some of the vaccines that are still in development? You know, like what what Picker's working on? How do they compare? Yeah, I mean, so it's sort of hard to say there aren't really any. Um, there, there's only one vaccine that's in like, late stage clinical trials, um, and there's not really a, a ton of optimism about that. Um, but to give some context, the 59% efficacy that um, Lewis showed in monkeys was a big deal. Um, there was a trial in 2009 that showed, it's not clear exactly what happened there and if this effect was real, but seemed to indicate a 30% protection. And just that wasn't enough to, for a licensed vaccine, but just 30% protection was huge for the field and like caused a lot of excitement. And so I think the expectation is that initially a vaccine is not going to be 100% effective. So if you were to say, for example, do a kind of, um, oftentimes if you want to make a new intervention that you think is going to be just as effective or around as effective as a existing intervention, you can do what's called a non-inferiority trial, um, which basically shows that a, a, a new intervention is no worse than the current intervention. But I think the general expectation is that any new vaccine, while important for public health, could be cheaper to give to the world, could, could give to more people than PrEP, um, is not going to hit that bar of 100%, 90% efficacy. Um, and so you're going to need to think even farther outside the box to run, to run a study. So zooming out, the researchers you spoke to for the story have generally been at this for a long time, which is to say they've seen failure after failure of seemingly promising vaccine candidates for HIV. How optimistic do you think the field is in general that this might finally work, that they might finally find a working vaccine for HIV? I think it's hard to tell. Um, no one, I sort of, I I got this idea, or, or, or sort of got to this idea of, of how difficult it was going to be by running clinical trials, to run clinical trials um, for a vaccine by talking to Lewis about his shot. Um, and I've sort of been then surveying uh, other folks in the field, and most of them are not as pessimistic as Lewis or won't out and out say, look, I don't think an HIV vaccine will ever be developed. Um, but there is definitely an understanding that, like, we are at a crossroads right now for the field. I heard that term, I think, multiple times. Um, and that, A, we're going to have to see how these new ideas work um, and uh, have to kind of come up with new ideas for how you run a trial. There's, There's sort of ideas that have been floated, but no one really had a clear sense of what a study would look like. Um, if you saw um, Anthony Fauci actually gave an interview last week to Science Magazine where he sort of expressed some of these same negative uh, sentiments as Lewis did, or not negative, but I guess like uh, perhaps clear-eyed, I'm not sure what the word, um, and 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 so there is definitely a sense that the field is, 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 is at a crossroads. Um, but I think there is still sort of optimism about the science that's being done here. Um, HIV, because it's been such a hard virus to vaccinate against, has forced the field to really push the limits of how we manipulate an immune system and how af and how we go after new viruses. Um, and so it's come up with ideas that have helped lay the groundwork for, for the COVID vaccines, for the um, new like RSV vaccines. Um, and so I think there's optimism that these new ideas, even if they don't lead us down a path that ends in an approved HIV vaccine, could still be 
really impactful in cancer, in TB, in other infections. And so um, there, there's still, I think, hope for the science, even if there's still outstanding questions as for what the ultimate goal will, will end up being in, in the HIV field. Well, Jason, thanks for walking us through all this. Thank you so much. That does it for another episode of The Read Out Loud. Thank you to Teresa Gaffney for producing this week's episode. Our senior producers are Hyacinth Epinato and Alyssa Ambrose. Our executive producer is Rick Burke. And our theme music is by Brian Joel. And as always, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you liked about this week's episode, what you didn't like, and who you think will win next year's Nobel Prize in Medicine. You can do all of that by sending us an email at readoutloud at statnews.com. And if you like what we do, leave a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. See you next week.